captain is the is a CNCF sandbox project that uh, we've been working on for the last two years. And with we, I mean an international you know open source community, but it is heavily driven uh, and supported by Dynatrace. However, you will see while Dynatrace plays a big part of uh, Captain because it integrates well, uh, it's not necessary to use Dynatrace in any capacity. Uh, you will see later on that we support and already provide integrations with other observability platforms like Prometheus uh, as well. So everything I show you today, there's no vendor lock-in to Dynatrace. Um, you can do whatever you want, basically, underneath the hood. Now, uh, at day, I'm a DevOps activist. Uh, not at night, but uh, regularly these days, I'm a DevRel for Captain. So I have um, a background in performance engineering, in observability, in monitoring. been working for Dynatrace for the last 12 and a half years. And before that, I worked eight years for a company that initially was called Segway, then was acquired by Borland, and now... I think is microfocus to the performance testing. So that's kind of my background is in performance engineering. The today's topic is really giving introducing you to Captain, our open source project, but really uh, showing you which problems we want to solve. Because just building another framework for something that right, doesn't help anybody. So I really want to address the problems and how we solve them. And my intention is to a grow the community on Captain and get honest feedback from the community because you are practitioners out there. And if you say, Andy, this is all BS, what you're saying, this doesn't work in real life, then I'll, I'll take this as well. Uh, I would obviously also like to hear something like, yes, this looks interesting, but here are some things that you may need to think about because these are challenges we also have. So please really give us feedback. Now, I want to quickly ask uh, for the polls. Uh, is it possible? We have two polls. Can we run the first poll before I get started? Uh, that yeah. would be great. Yep, yep. Which one? Um, oh, Tom's done that. If that's possible, yeah. I'm not sure if... Do you know which one is the first one? It's the... Uh, so we're just running the one in regards to which, which statement. Um, yeah, exactly. Yep, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so Results are coming through. We'll, we'll yell out once we've got some of the results. Okay, perfect. So then uh, let me continue though, because um, let me, that, that I raised the question because I'm interested in, in, in the current state of continuous delivery with your organization. I mean, this is a continuous delivery meetup, so I assume you're hopefully all already in your journey. Um, now, I want to start with, this is, I think, one of the views that you see from us as the captain team, but I'm sure also from other, um, you know, uh, tool vendors in the space. They basically tell you, hey, this is the modern way of doing continuous delivery or progressive delivery, and also including operational workflows because delivery is not everything, right? Obviously, once we deliver something in production, then uh, you want to make sure that the system stays healthy. And I think a lot of us are asked by our organizations to invest in these new platforms that can do something like this, right? If you have a dev staging and prod environment where I have my service in version three deployed, then we want to build an environment or provide a self-service environment where a developer can simply make a pull request that is then promoting the latest build into the first stage, automatic deployment and testing, and then evaluation of that artifact of that deployment against your service level objectives. Uh, if you have never heard about service level objectives before, I will introduce you later on. But the point is we do an evaluation and if the if the piece that we have just been deployed and tested is good enough, our pipelines should be able to automatically promote this into the next pre-production stage, like staging. Again, what the environment should then do, deploy, maybe run some more intensive tests, some performance tests, some scalability tests, maybe also include some chaos engineering there. And then after these tests are run, again, evaluate the service level objectives. Does my deployed version number four actually meet all of my success criteria? And if so, then I'm not sure about you, but most organizations, while everybody loves automatic promotion all the way into production, some people are still scared or cannot do it for any type of reasons, uh, maybe for compliance reasons, for governance, then you want to have a delivery pipeline where you can actually say, I have, let's say, a release manager or whatever this person is called that can then click on the button and say, hey, I have a new build available. It, it, it achieved all the success criteria successfully, but then now what do we do we want to deploy the SNO? And if we want, then our pipelines should be able to do progressive delivery like blue greens or canaries. When we do 
deploy blue green in production let's say version number four ne uh, next door to version number three then evaluate right and in case it turns out hey actually build number four is not as good in production as it was in pre-prod then with these progressive delivery models it's easy for us and it should be fully automated to, to toggle and switch back what's important though every time we make a change in every environment we always need to reevaluate if we are back at a healthy state and i think this is this this process this delivery process heavily automated um, is really what a lot of us are striving for. And right? automated deployment, testing, evaluation, promotion, canaries, blue greens, and all this stuff is in there. Now, but this is not everything. Uh, what is missing here is actually what happens when we deliver in production. This is where, in case you have your observability tool, whether it's Prometheus and it sends alerts, whether you have Dynatrace or any other APM tools out there, and, and they, these are then triggering a problem, then instead of having somebody manually look at this problem, we also, I think, are asked to invest in automation in production to bring the system back to its its desired state or healthy state. So this could be execute uh, a runbook, like, hey, if this problem comes in, we first try to scale up. Then every time we execute an action that modifies the environment, we need to evaluate again. So evaluating against your SLOs. If the action doesn't provide the desired result, then execute the next action until we actually get to the point where the system is back to a healthy state. That's kind of the idea. So what I'm what I'm pointing, what I'm painting here is basically a picture of I think this is where a lot of us and the industry wants us to go. Automated progressive delivery to increase speed and quality of delivery, and then also automating operations. Now the challenge or the, the truth is though, and this is based on service we ran with our customers and also things we have seen when working with the Captain Open Source CNCF community, that only a very small number of organizations are actually doing true progressive delivery and automated operations. And with Captain, we are trying to address the key problems. And I'm focusing on three today, even though I think we are we're addressing more, but because we have about an hour and I think I want to make it you know, to give you some information on what are the immediate things we can help you with with Captain. Let's focus on three things. The first thing is the way we are dealing with pipelines right now. Uh, we are spending a lot of time in, in maintaining them. Uh, the way we deal with manual tasks along delivery and the way we're dealing with manual remediations uh, in, in production. So these are three problems we've identified and I want to now jump into each of those and then along the way also show you Captain how it feels, how it looks and what we've thought about. So the first one, is that we have seen in our organization and with organizations we work with that we are spending and wasting a lot of time in maintaining the classical monolithic pipelines that we have that have worked well for monolithic apps but now we're trying to use this in modern applications and i think they're not the right fit to give you an example this is a screenshot of one of our jenkins pipelines it's actually not that big 350 plus lines the problem with the Jenkins pipelines that we have, and this was started with one of our, uh, when we moved a couple of years ago over to more containerized based uh, application architecture, uh, we, we obviously took Jenkins because that's what we knew. Um, so that new, the team started building their own Jenkins pipelines. And they followed the way Jenkins pipelines have been built, which is you have one Jenkins file and you have mixed information about the process, the target platform, the environments and the tools. So everything is very hard coded and hardwired, but the biggest problem is really that we are putting things together in a file that I think should not be together um, because there's no clear separation of concerns because the same team that defines the process, let's say the DevOps team and the say or the reliability team and the same team that defines the tools, they all have to collaborate on that same piece of configuration, which is the Jenkins file in this case. And and this is this on its own, I think, is a challenge. We all have to touch the same files. Um, the other thing is when we started with our move towards uh, containerized platforms and using traditional pipelines, we started with a pipeline for one service that worked great. Then we had um, different, we, we took this as a template. We slightly modified it for different types of services because they had some uniquenesses to it. So we ended up with some permutations. And then eventually, months later, years later, we ended up with the snowflake effect where from the initial pipeline that did a job really well for a service we ended up with hundreds of different permutations and now if something breaks you have to figure out why does it break who who actually came up with that pipeline who modified it why is this plugin in there where why is the secret not there uh, why does this jenkins plugin why is this not updated because i need a new version and things like this and i think this is why 
a lot of organizations are are spending a lot of time, including us internally, to keep the, the pipelines running. So now the question is, how can we solve this problem? And we believe it can be done through an event-driven approach to delivery. Now, what that means is, if you look at uh, a classical you know, kind of delivery flow, where you have different tasks on the left, this is kind of your process, and then your tooling, right now you may have a lot of these things hard-coded. Now, what we are proposing is you're breaking up these barriers. You're actually separating the process definition with the actors, the tooling. And you are connecting them just as in modern software architecture where we break monoliths apart into smaller services. You're connecting them through events or messages, right? I mean, that's basically what it is. Modern software architecture also works that way. And we can do the same thing for continuous delivery. So that means if we have somebody that maintains the process and we have a list of tools that can that have certain capabilities, then whoever maintains the process can say, hey, I need to deploy container number one in dev stage with blue-green. Sends an event and then the tool that has this capability, the tools that have registered, let's say, for the deployment event, then can say, hey, uh, I can deploy in dev with blue-green. Let me do this. And then the tool does it and sends back the event of the success status. And then the, the maintainer of the, um, of the workflow is basically continuing that workflow or stopping the workflow depending on the success. So it's, it's a very simple concept, right? It's nothing magic, but um, just applying these principles to continuous delivery. So process definition, tool definition. And this is also what has influenced the way we have built and architectured Captain. So Captain is a CNCF open source project. You need to deploy it on Kubernetes. However, this does not mean that you can only use Captain for applications deployed on Kubernetes. This is something I want to say because a lot of people say, so this only works for Kubernetes? What if I have my traditional applications? What needs to be installed is the control plane, which means when you install Captain, you get the uh, kind of the, the core, which is the control plane that manages and orchestrates uh, processes, delivery and operational processes. We also use eventing, obviously. Now, a magic component to all of this is the shipyard file. So the shipyard file uh, is where, let's say, the site reliability engineer or whoever that is in your team can define the, the process itself. So that means, um, do you have dev staging and prod? So which stages do you have? What type of, what type of deployment should happen? Direct deployment in dev, blue-green in staging, canary in production, and what type of testing? should happen in each stage. So this is what we've specified right now. We call this the shipyard file, so process definition. Then on the other side, we have the tooling definition completely separate. can be done by somebody completely different, the, the, the DevOps team, the platform team, the tooling team. This is basically then you install individual tools that are saying, I have this capability. That means I can handle a deployment request. I can handle a test request. I can notify people. So these tools can do different things and they are basically subscribing to Captain events. And the nice thing is you can now have the site reliability engineers in my example, change the process. Let's say they need to add a new stage. They are because maybe you need to add a security stage or you are switching from uh, blue green and staging to something else, right? So you can change this completely independent from the tooling. And you can also change the tools without having to change or, or, or update all of your hardwired processes because they're completely separated. The beneficiary of all of this is the developer, which means as a developer, I can now say, I have a new artifact. Now, send it along the way, and Captain, you orchestrate the process. That means if I say, Captain, I have a new artifact, Captain then goes off and basically sends it through the well-defined process based on the shipyard and then the individual tools that are able to react to these uh, events that can do certain things will do the things. Right? What you also see here in the very beginning, which I didn't mention, Captain itself keeps a Git repository internally. So all the configuration files, your Helm charts, your testing files, your SLI definitions, your SLO definitions is all stored and maintained within a Git repository that Captain holds. So that means it, you know, we're trying to follow a GitOps approach. Um, and that means if you're then, uh, sending a new artifact through, all the individual tools can get their configuration files from that Git repository. All right. Time for the first demo. Uh, what I have is actually that three-stage pipeline. And I have a sample app that I typically use. I'm also using it today. When I have more time, I go through all four builds. But in this case, I'm just using one build, which means I have build number three deployed earlier. And actually, I already ran build number four. 
Uh, and what, what I will show you is how Captain has taken this, has updated my Git repo with the new version information, has done a direct deployment. I'm using Helm for deployment. And then I use some GMeter tests for, for a test execution. Then a quality gate is evaluated by looking at SLIs and SLOs. Then I specify that I want to do automated approval and staging. So if the quality gate is good, gets approved, same thing happens again, Git change, because for every stage, Captain holds a Git branch with all the relevant artifacts for that particular branch, reflecting the desired state uh, of that stage. And then at the end, again, when the deployment is done and the tests are run, quality gate is enforced. And in my case, I have actually specified in production, I want to have manual approval. And then Captain gives me the, do you want to really promote this? Yes or no. And if it does, it does a blue green and then keeps it or rolls it back. And this is actually where I jump into the demo. So let me walk over. So what I have here, this is actually my uh, my Captain installation. As you can see here, I have a couple of projects. I'm using the Captain 07 project today. If I click on environment, this is actually where you see I have in dev version number four deployed. And don't get too excited because it's not an exciting sample app, but it does its job. So this is an app that runs uh, on my Kubernetes cluster or is deployed by Captain on Kubernetes cluster. Build number four is in dev, in staging. I also have build number four that's in staging. And in in production, I have build number three right now. At least I think so. Exactly, build number three. But what Captain tells me is, hey, um, you would have a new build available because build number four has been sent along the way and it achieved 100% of, uh, of a rating in the quality gate before production. Now I can send it off. This is one option that I have, but before I do it here, I actually go to a different view. So this is kind of the environment view, what happens in which environment. I can also go to the service view. Now I only have one service here, but basically what it tells me is, you see here at today at 6.53, before I made my way to the office to give you this presentation, I sent build number four uh, on its way. And Captain was basically, remember sending all these events and this is now kind of the event stream so first the deployment happened then the tests were executed then uh captain retrieved data from the the observability tool made a decision good or no good then it deployed it into staging with an automated approval strategy and so on configuration change deployment test finished then i had a little more of the quality gates so this is a, a section i will cover in my second part of that of the demo um, and explain this a little bit more. And now we're sitting here, hey, um, we achieved 100%, that's great. Now ready for broad, for prod. So let's send it along the way, which means now Captain continues that process, which is great, right? So what have I really done to kick this off or what have I done to set all of this up? Just as I explained earlier. So this is when I, when I created uh, my Captain project, you have to give it a shipyard file, remember? So this is where I specified I have a dev stage I have a staging stage and I have a production stage. This is my process definition, my stages. And within every stage, you specify what should happen, what type of deployment strategy, what test strategy, what approval strategy. Um, and, and this is basically how you specify, how you specify the process that is orchestrated by Captain. And then what I also have, um, remember the, it's called the uniform, like which tools uh, do I actually have? Uh, there's, we're currently working on that actual file where you can configure all this through a file right now in its current version of Captain. Uh, I basically just install my Captain services. These are all just containers. So I, for instance, have installed uh, my Helm service that can do a deployment, my GMeter service. Uh, I have my Lighthouse service, which is doing the evaluation. So that means whatever tool you have, um, well, Prometheus support, right? That's remediation service. Whatever tool you want to add to Captain, you just install it in that Captain Kubernetes namespace and then register for the events um, and, and that's it. And we're going to, in the next version of Captain 0.8, which is planned later in the year, we will really give you a config file where then Captain is basically then say uh, kind of an operator and then Captain is deploying all the tools for you. But right now it's in order to set up a new tool, it's just a kubectl apply and you add this new tool to it. So this is this. And what I also want to show you Let's see, build number four has been deployed. That's great, which means I can now see build number four also in prod. Very cool. So that's now been deployed. Now tests are running. And then uh, once the tests are done, Captain will make a decision. Is it good to keep in prod or bad? 
And I'll give you a little spoiler alert here. Build number four, I have built problems in build number four that only happen in production. So it should be rolled back to the, to the previous version in a couple of minutes. But what I still wanted to show you is, so I showed you that when setting up this project, uh, I've used a, a, a YAML file, a so-called shipyard. And Captain Internally, as I told you, also keeps a Git repo. And what I've specified, I, I, can, I can link my project with an upstream Git, in my case on GitHub. So this is my, my project here. And you can see here that here is my initial shipyard file. And what Captain also does, it creates branches for every stage. So let's go into the staging stage. So this means here are all the supporting file so that every individual tool that will participate can get the file it needed. So for instance, here are my JMeter scripts. So because I'm using JMeter and once JMeter says, yes, I can run the test that you want me to run in staging, it will have access to all the files in this Git repo and staging. What else do we have for deployment? I have my simple node here. This is, uh, here are my supporting files for Helm, for instance. So here is my initial Helm chart that I've uploaded. Um, and, and Captain maintains this, and then every time I push it through, uh, what it actually does, um, it will automatically update the values YAML file for me. Let me make it a little bigger, right? Every time I say Captain, I have a new artifact, it will automatically update uh, this version information, and then the Helm service will say, okay, I use this plus the rest of the Helm chart to then do my deployment. And there's more supporting files. Like again, JMeter, I can even provide different tests for different services. I also use my SLO file. These are my service level objectives. So what type of metrics are interesting for me and what type of criteria should they have? So this is all in, all in, 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 all in Git, okay? Cool. All right, so um, let me continue. This was the first use case. We wanna provide a new way to continuous delivery, event-driven, separating process and tooling. Now, we are not uh, the only ones that are just uh, using this for demos. We have customers or users as well. Patrick, they're using GitLab for CI, where they're building their containers and pushing it to a registry. And then, and this is one of the use cases, then they just make a REST call to Captain, say, Captain, I have a new artifact, and then Captain runs off and, and does its magic. So just to give you an idea of, you can, Captain has an API and a CLI, and you can obviously trigger Captain from the outside world to then initiate its, its, its process. So first use case, I'm watching my time, but I think very good in timing. Second use case is, while Captain does all of this end to end, we also believe there are certain things in a lot of existing delivery pipelines that also need attention and that we want to also provide a solution for without just having to say, you need to take everything from Captain end to end. So let me explain what that means. Uh, we have seen that organizations also, again, including us that have invested in, in, in automation on delivery, whatever tools you're using, you use your Jenkins or your GitLab or whatever you have for build, deploy, for run tests. And then typically comes the time when somebody has to say, is this a good build or not a good build? And I know some of you may have already done a great job in automating that as much as possible. However, I think the majority of organizations have not automated that. Meaning when uh, your functional tests fail, making it an automated decision, is this test really critical for our business requirements? Yes or no? Because in most organizations, they don't even know, is this a critical test? Yes or no? That's, that's another problem on its own. If you have performance tests running, uh, and it says the response time is the same, so it looks good, but what if memory or CPU all of a sudden went up? Is this still something you want to then lead, let into production? Or if you're adding monitoring data to your analysis, then you have even more data and, and people are already overwhelmed. So we see that this overwhelm, this overwhelm now amount of data, overwhelming amount of data, sometimes slows people down. And this is also what we want to solve. How do we solve it? By automating quality gates based on SLIs and SLOs. Now, if you've never heard about SLIs and SLOs, then it, it's nothing that I invented. Um, I'm not sure if Google really invented it, but at least they made it very public through their site reliability engineering practices. So to make it very simple, an SLI is a service level indicator, something that you can measure, like the login, the error rate of your login requests, right? If you have an app that does login and you have tests against it, 
then an error rate is something you can measure. And SLO is an objective. So what is your objective for a particular SLI for you to consider it successful? And this is typically something like the login error rate must be less than 2% over a 30 period of time. Right? Then it's successful. Then the SLAs, and this is something that people are more familiar with because the term has been around for much longer, is what happens if in case I cannot meet my SLOs. Maybe you have some business agreements, some legal obligations, right? If your website is down or if you're, if an API that is used by a, by a paying third party, what happens in case you cannot deliver or ensure the availability? These are the SLAs. Again, Google did a great job in explaining all these concepts great material out there, check out the SRE book. Um, but in the end, it's very simple. SLIs drive SLOs, which inform SLAs. So something we can measure against an objective. And if we don't meet this objective, then we may have a problem. Now, this is great because we see more and more organizations thinking about SLIs and SLOs. So what is successful for them? And more and more monitoring tool and observability platforms have support for this. So you can use this in production and alert and report on a monthly basis, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, how are your critical metrics, indicators uh, living up to your objectives. Right? So this is cool. But the problem is, why do we only start using this in production? Why not just shifting left? And this is where Captain Quality Gates come in. So we're taking uh, something that has been now kind of accepted as a de facto standard for measuring quality and success of software and services in production and shifting it left. And basically, again, this is nothing new, but we're just applying the same terminology because I think it's going to be easier for people to understand. Um, so instead of doing looking at metrics and comparing them against thresholds or previous timeframes, in production only, we can do it, or Captain does it, on a build-to-build-to-build -to -build -to -build basis, on a deployment-to-deployment-deployment -deployment -deployment basis, and therefore always gives you feedback on how you're doing. Um, quick explainer on how this works. So with Captain, you specify your SLIs. That means these are the metrics that you want, and they can come from different tools. This is an example from Dynatrace, but they could be Prometheus metrics or any type of data source. You specify your SLOs. These are your, what are your objectives? And here you can actually combine absolute values, like has to be faster than 100 milliseconds or has to be faster than 250 milliseconds. But you can also combine it with relative values. What you see on the login response time SLI, where it says has to be faster than 100 milliseconds and has to be faster than plus 10% of the previous build. So this is for where Captain also builds in a capability to compare with previous builds. And this is basically a simple regression detection. And then you also specify an overall goal. So Captain looks at all the SLIs, is then calculating a score between zero and 100. And then you say, how many points do you need to achieve in order for you to consider this build or this deployment is good? And then the way this works then, if you integrate this in your existing pipeline, you say, Captain, you go off and you analyze these metrics for this time frame, And then Captain comes with the metrics, grades them, and then gives you an overall score. Build number one looks good. Give you a full example. Build number two comes along. It seems response time and failure rate are degrading, going into the warning level which means we only get 75% is a warning, and then you can decide what you do with the warning. Is warning still good enough to go into the next stage or not? Build three comes along, right? Maybe the developers say, let's fix these performance problems. Yes, they fix them. However, they've introduced a regression on the login transaction, where now the number of backend service calls has increased by from one to two, but it was not allowed based on the SLO, because in the SLO, we said, we never allow a change in backend service calls, because for login, I only want to make one backend call and not two. So this is why we're getting penalized. Less points failed. And then build number four comes along so the developers can immediately react on this and then everything is good. So it's a very simple concept, right? If you think about it. Um, a little technical background. So the way Captain implements this, because I'm pretty sure if you like this concept, if you want to do it, you also want to know how you can apply this into your environment. Um, the way this works, Captain specifies SLIs in the YAML file where it has uh, a, a logical name like error rate. And then depending on the tool that you want to pull the data from, let's say the query language. Like in this case, it's the Dynatrace query language for a particular metric. Then you specify your SLOs 
in the SLO file, you say, this is the, like say, for the metric error rate, here is my pass and my warning criteria. What's not in here, but there's more to it, you can also specify different weights for different SLIs. So you can say error rate is more important than anything else, or then let's say twice as important, or you can also specify key SLIs. You can say error rate is the most important thing. If error rate fails, I don't care about the rest, I want the build to fail. So that's a couple of cool things we built in. Um, you also see the quality gate data. Data comes from, the, from, from tools and they are just integrated with Captain through the same eventing mechanism. That's why you can integrate any type of tool by just building your own uh, Captain SLI provider. And when then you actually ask Captain, Captain, I want you to evaluate, because you can also ask Captain just for doing this particular piece, then Captain will reach out to these tools. The tools give back the data. Captain grades every single metric based on your SLOs and then comes up with a total score. And then based on that total score, you can do whatever you want. So this is it. Uh, let me give you a second a demo. Um, for, I mean, I'm a little biased here, obviously, because I work for Dynatrace. So I'm showing you the Dynatrace integration. The Prometheus integration is similar for Dynatrace. However, we have we've included one convenience convenience layer instead of have you having to define SLI and SLO YAMLs in YAML files. We allow you, if you are a Dynatrace user, to just create a dashboard and you can put metrics on that dashboard and these are then automatically the metrics that are analyzed in the quality gate. So these are all the SLIs. So that's basically the, the idea. So let me just show you this quickly and go back to my example from before. Right? If you remember, build number four made it through in, uh, in, in, in staging. Everything was green, 100%. And actually now if I go to prod, look at this, it actually got was red because we still do the evaluation. And this is why the build was actually discarded and rolled back. So let me actually first check this. This was build number four and prod earlier. Now let's hit refresh. Now build number three is back because Captain has automatically rolled it back. It's great. But let me actually show you what is behind the scenes here. Um, again, there's an SLI and an SLO underneath the hood. But what we've just implemented, is a convenient thing where you can, in my case, just create a dashboard and put all the metrics on it. And here is my dashboard. It opens up directly with that time frame of the evaluation. But you can see here, I put on uh, response time P95, so 95th percentile, 90th percentile, 50th percentile, uh, all the different uh, response time, failure rate, and number of backend service calls by uh, by business transactions, invoke, version, echo, so also features of my app, and some other metrics. So the way this works, I just put it on the dashboard. I give it here my criteria, my pass and warning criteria. I can specify some overall goals. You can see a total pass 90%. And, and this really then gets translated underneath the hood into the SLI and SLO files. Just a convenience thing. And the cool thing is now it will be automatically analyzed as part of my delivery. But what I also want to show you, because this part of section of my demo is really about how can you use that capability uh, also in, let's say, in your existing pipeline. So I have a Jenkins pipeline here. Don't get scared of Jenkins. It, it looks the way it looks. I know there's better ways of doing this, but um, I have a, just to show you how this works, right? I have built a Jenkins pipeline where I can uh, just make a call to Captain and say, Captain, please, uh, do a quality gate evaluation. So I have a captain project called quality gate, quality stage and evil service. And I basically give it a time range. This is just really to show you how you can integrate captain quality gates in your existing delivery pipeline. We have a Jenkins library where you can just call it captain directly from Jenkins with a single, with an existing library. We have an Azure DevOps integration with a GitLab template. So it's easy to integrate. So now basically what Captain does, or what Jenkins does, it triggers a quality gate on a different project with different SLIs and SLOs. And it came back with warning. It says Captain score was only 38.88. So that's not good. So let's actually have a look at this. Uh, Captain results in bridge. So let's open up that link. We also have uh, deep links. That means you get directly then to that result. And here we go. So this is now just a quality gate project, right? So I'm not using Captain here for delivery or for auto remediation. It is just basically a project where I can call it from the outside. And you can see here my history. 
So historically, I had a lot of builds kicked off by Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins can also pass in the Jenkins job ID. So I know on the x-axis what where this came from. And I can see that this build here, the latest one, was compared to this one. We also allow you to compare with the previous, with multiple previous ones, only that are good or bad builds. And I can see all of the metrics that actually have failed. Remember the metrics for this individual run, again, in my case, come from a dashboard. So I built a dashboard that looks like this, has all the, the metrics on it, right? So in my response time, my failure rate, my process CPU, my host CPU, so these are all the metrics. Just put it on the dashboard and that's it. And, uh, and Captain, where is it? Captain analyzed it for me. And it tells me which metrics have been uh, violating uh, your SLOs. And what's also nice, we also give you this overview here, which I think is cool. You can also see some historical trend data of, of these metrics. All right. Uh, to give another example of one of our users, uh, Christian, they're using GitLab for uh, for delivery. So you see here, they do build, deploy, and test. And then for verify, they basically now say, Captain, you know what? You go off, you go to all of our monitoring tools, you pull in the data, and you then do the calculation. So that's a very easy integration step for, for, for this use case. Okay. All right. Uh, last section, and this is the fastest one uh, because no more live demo, but then I'm looking forward uh, to uh, Q&A. Uh, yeah, uh, the problem that we've that I want to address in this section is we are seeing a lot of time spent and wasted in manual troubleshooting and remediation in case you have problems in production. How we want to address this is again through an event-driven SRE-inspired approach for auto remediation workflows in production. Because earlier I showed you a captain for delivery, orchestrating a delivery process of deploy, test, validate, and promote. And Captain also has a second type of process he can orchestrate, which is when a problem comes in, then execute action A, validate action B, validate, and so on. So here's how it looks like. We call it closed loop remediation. It was introduced with Captain 0.7. That means uh, if you have any type of monitoring tool that gives you an alert, then you can send this to Captain. And in Captain, you can specify a remediation workflow. So this is specified again in the YAML. It is similar to the shipyard file that I showed you earlier, where in the shipyard we had the different delivery stages and what should happen. In this case, this defines the, the process and the workflow of actions that should be executed in case a certain problem comes in. And so what Captain does, it says, hey, for this problem, the user has specified this workflow. So the first thing is execute scale up action. Then the action is executed. Remember, everything Captain does, it just sends an event. And then you can add any type of tool that can then act on that event. Most importantly, after the event is executed or after the action is executed, Captain evaluates this. Did this actually solve the problem? Is the system back to a healthy state based on the SLOs? If not, executes the next action and then again evaluates. And if this solves the problem, great. If not, obviously you can still escalate as the default action at the very end. Uh, this is kind of the ideal state in production for automating runbooks, automating remediation. Now, most of you may say, well, this is very risky. I don't want to try things out the first time in production. I agree with you. This is why I believe this is a great chance to do this in pre-prod or in a chaos or in, in a safe environment where you combine this with chaos engineering. So what you should do and what, we've, what we try to advocate for is Use chaos engineering, use chaos tools to simulate problems. This can, first of all, validate does your monitoring and observability work correctly? Do you actually get the right alerts? And then you can use this to actually validate, uh, you know, optimize, define your remediation workflows. Because if chaos comes in, then you want to make sure that you can handle chaos correctly. And if Kubernetes underneath the hood doesn't solve everything by restarting and recycling pods, if you really need to execute actions on a, on a higher level, then this is a great way of, of kind of testing and defining and, and, and validating your auto remediation scripts. Because this is also then going to be code later on, quote unquote, that runs in production. And a, every code that runs in production should be tested earlier. And this is, I think, why, why this is so important that we also think start thinking about this. So to let's wrap it up. 
What is Captain? Captain is an event-based control plane for continuous delivery and automated operations. It manages these two processes. It says here for cloud native applications. Uh, but it really can do it for anything because it's event-driven and you can call any type of tooling. Um, we are basing everything on standards, standard protocols, standard tools. It's very easy for you to build your own services, very easy to uh, replace tools or add in new tools. Really, the, the thing we wanted to set out for is at, is at least to solve these three problems I've highlighted today. And hopefully you see that we are, we are, we are really helpful and then the way we approach this is actually actually makes sense. If you want to get started, right? Um, Tutorials.captain.sh. I think that's what I. That's a great starting point. There's also some other things, and uh, yeah. Now I would love to, um, a uh, have an idea. Well, I think we did a poll in the beginning. I have a second poll uh, that I would also like to start because this helps us also with Q and A. Um, it comes to the delivery and, and how you're dealing with your manifests and, and helm charts. But I kind of want to start and, and hand it over to um, doing some Q&A now. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I, 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 Andy, have you had a chance to see the results from the first poll at all? Or would you like me to kind of... I have, I have not seen them because I... Let me just... Um, no worries. So we, had, we had 29 people answer the first poll. And we had just... 50% say that we still have too many manual steps from dev to production. Um, and then secondly, we had pipeline code is heavily up, uh, customized and therefore hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other two were, were trailing behind at 7 and 14%. Yeah, so that's uh, that's actually, yeah, uh, it kind of, I hope, I, I think this kind of proves also my point that we, that we we are we, we we know we have a problem currently in delivery and we need some new approaches uh, i know also with captain we're obviously not the only tool and framework that tries to solve this problem um but it's it, that's at least a good confirmation yeah thank you and and with the other poll we're still getting results through but at the moment 50 percent of people are saying one manifest with with helm chart per service per service okay yeah. actually I'm, i just switched over to the uh uh the polls now see yeah perfect yeah one of the questions i had for you is, and and i think you did mention this earlier is that you um you meant uh, it seems that uh captain runs on on kubernetes does this mean that it, it can be the only it can only do things that you showed on, on kubernetes or can it also be used for non-kubernetes no it, yeah a very good question this is also by i I kind of assume this question is coming because I, I, I hear this all the time. And people say, yeah, but I'm, I'm not on Kubernetes. So why are you telling me all of this? So Captain itself runs on Kubernetes. Uh, let me just um, go back to my, right? It, it runs on Kubernetes, but uh, what you can do with Captain, Captain is an event-driven system. That means, first of all, you saw, I integrated the quality gate capability in my Jenkins, right? There's no, Jenkins just deploys somewhere, and then the only thing that Captain does now, well, don't, the only thing, it's a great thing, it reaches out to my data sources and pulls the data back. And where this data comes from is completely up to the your monitoring, your observability tool, or whatever data source you, you, you put in. It can be anything. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, we have a Captain sandbox. So we have multiple repos or organizations on Git. There's the, there's the captain, uh, captain, captain, and then there's captain sandbox and captain contrib. So we are following the CNCF approach here. Now on captain sandbox, you already see a lot of other extensions. So like uh, the Jenkins tutorial, a litmus, Ansible tower, there's a lot of stuff in here. And for instance, one of those coming to Jenkins, there's a little more on Jenkins here. There is a Jenkins service, which means you can use captain and say captain, my process looks like this. I have dev staging and prod, but for deployment, I want to call a Jenkins pipeline because we have a good Jenkins pipeline that can do the deployment wherever. So you can actually use the Jenkins service to then react on a deployment request. Um, it doesn't have to be Jenkins. It can be, um, you know, we also have the uh, generic executor service where you can for any type of captain event, execute a shell script or an HTTP webhook. So you can really trigger whatever you want. Yeah, great. Um, is there some way that we're able to, to get an overview of the existing uh, captain integrations? 
Yeah, that's a good point. So I think the best overview is starting in the Captain Sandbox and also in the Captain. So Sandbox is where most um, integrations live or actually where they start, where they are born kind of. And then those that um, have a certain adoption, uh, those that um, have been around for a while and that are that we think are valuable enough and, and they also meet some quality criteria, then they go into Contrib. Um, so this is where we have uh, five integrations right now. Yeah. And so it will definitely be there. And then there's, there's Captain Captain, that's kind of the core project. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, the last question for me was, was, was I guess, um, how do you compare Argo or any other delivery tools that are emerging in the, the cloud native landscape? Yeah, that's a good point, a good question, because I think I said, you know, obviously there's a lot of tools that are trying to solve certain challenges in continuous delivery. Yeah. And and our our mission is not to rip and replace anybody. Our our mission is to provide value to existing delivery pipelines. So for instance, for Argo, there's two options. We can either from Argo call captain for the quality gates which is a common use case so do let argo do the deployment because that's a really good end and then have captain call it or you can use captain to orchestrate the end-to-end -end delivery but for the actual deployment we call argo and then once argo is done we do the testing and i think the the, the what we try to do is we, we don't Captain itself, we cannot be the best in everything, and that's also not what we want to do. What we want to be good in is the orchestration of the processes, and uh, the I think a key component to Captain is this: every time we do something, we we evaluate if the action was actually good by looking at the SLIs and SLOs. So the SLI and SLO component is very core, but then we want people to use the tools that are best for the job. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, that's all the questions from me. I, I don't know if Tom or, or Stephen, I know that Stephen's lurking, he keeps saying he's lurking, but I know that he's around, has any other questions. Um, there hasn't been any that's come through the question tab. Um, maybe because it's a Tuesday, people haven't been having a cheeky drink and their confidence is a bit low, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Tom or Stephen, did you have any? Did anything that you want to ask? Yeah, I, I've got a quick one. How are you going, Andres? Hi. Thank you very much for sharing. This is a this is a super interesting uh, interesting approach, uh, which I'm looking forward to playing with personally. Cool. Um, you, you've been very very gracious and have not been trying to sell us Dynatrace every three and a half seconds. I don't really know an awful lot about Dynatrace. Like, can you give us like a sort of what, one minute summary of where Dynatrace is up to the business problems it solves? Yeah, uh, why, sure. Why do we need it? Yeah, I mean, I on purposely obviously didn't didn't uh, go into too deep because I really my mission today was to show you more about Captain. But if you ask, then I will definitely do it. So uh, you know, Dynatrace, we are a software intelligence platform, uh, which means we have an agent-based technology. Uh, we call it the one agent. It's a single agent that you either install on your physical machines, on your virtual machines, in your serverless applications. You roll it out on Kubernetes to an operator. And basically what uh, Dynatrace does, it does automated full-stack observability um, to uh, of like your whole system. Uh, let me just show you actually. Uh, this is my... Uh, where's my uh, simple note? Here we go. All right. So in this case, um, I've done nothing other than installing an operator in my Kubernetes cluster. So what Dynatrace does, full stack monitoring from the end user. That means once Dynatrace monitors an application or a system where you have applications to the end users, we monitor every click, every swipe, uh, then go into the process. In my case, the process is a Node.js process sitting in Kubernetes containers, so we automatically get the visibility into containers. Also, we know where these containers run, even on which virtualization platform. So we do full stack um, visibility. We also do automated distributed tracing end to end. That means from the browser through all of your environments. But the magic potion behind the scenes is we're not only collecting data, because we do collect a lot of data, obviously. Um, but we also do automated root cause detection. So that means we baseline all your metrics. And in case there is an anomaly, we say uh, there is an issue and we want you to look at this issue. And if I give you a little idea here, let me just go seven days. 
and then uh, I was let me just do you know, still this is just my demo environment where I don't really have the best uh here we go so like from an application perspective so in this case dynatrace tells me hey your simple node in staging has a failure rate increase so it's abnormal failures based on the baseline and it tells me that there were eighteen thousand six hundred potential calls impacted by the failure but what it also tells me is the root cause and the root cause in this case is a deployment that was made in my case actually with captain part of one of my captain demos I get the full link back to that captain deployment. I get a link to that particular application that was deployed. Uh, and then I can go in and I can go down to the code level, to the errors. I can then analyze. So everything that that, that's, um, that kind of helps me to, to understand the problem and the root cause. So this is, I guess, a, a quick overview. It's a software intelligence platform. We provided a SaaS and as managed, so you can either run it through our SaaS service where you only need to install the agents, or you can also install it on premise and you can also start a free trial. Cool. Thank you for that. Uh, that's, that that's the first really that I have seen of the product. We might we might just because it, it looked uh, devastatingly easy to get some visibility up yeah. on, on a Kubernetes cluster. What we might yeah. do is maybe see if we can get a little bit of a workshop or something and see if we can get yeah. a little bit of your time and see if anybody wants to join and come along and learn learn how to learn how to play with it. Yeah, exactly. And if you talk about Kubernetes, so I do have a I do have a YouTube channel. So my, my role is DevRel, right? Um, so I have a YouTube channel where I keep producing new technical material uh, by mainly either working with uh, with practitioners or our product managers. And if you are interested in Kubernetes, I think that's a good one. I just did one session recently with a product manager. And let me put this into the chat. So he showed the latest on our Kubernetes capabilities. Awesome. Sounds good. Cool. Um, Tom, was there anything you wanted to add? No, 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 thank you for, for the chat, Andreas. Obviously, I think it was so good that people didn't really need to ask questions. So props to you. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, obviously, check out the coming upcoming events and on webinar.meetupmadness.io. Um, like I said, the next one's in the pipeline. We just need to confirm a few dates and the exact speakers. Obviously, without kind of you guys... There is no meetup, so we'd like any kind of feedback that you can give. Um, we send out a, an after uh, an after meetup kind of review form, and if also if any of you guys feel like you want to have a chat, um, anyone can kind of present on anything they like around SRE and and cloud. Um, so yeah, we'd be keen to have you guys, obviously chat on future events um so once again thanks to dinah trace and, and thanks to andreas for his informative um informative chat on on Cap uh, is it captain or captain it's captain so it's the in case you wonder where this name comes from it looks a little strange it's the german phonetic for a captain right and wow. the our our mission is we want to we want to ship your code safely into the production harbor, and for that you need a good captain to steer you through the challenges of quality problems along the way. And so yeah, and obviously in 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 Kubernetes everything is Nordic, so like in, in not Nordic terms, not not naughty, but <laughs> Nordic. <laughs> Sometimes it feels naughty too. Ah uh, yeah, but that's what it is, captain. And uh, yeah, it would be great if some of you are you know following us on, on Twitter or joining on this joining us on the Slack channel. We need feedback, and we need. We need also if anybody wants to contribute to an open source project, we have uh, we have good first issues as we call them on the uh, Captain Git repo, where even if you don't have great development skills or only a little bit of time, there's definitely something in for everyone to contribute. That's brilliant. Thanks for that. Obviously, I don't think half of you would be where you are without open source. Um, it's something that I I love working with companies that open source of technology so definitely get on that and contribute guys feeling schön and dank ja bitte schön <laughs> freut mich wer spricht da deutsch <laughs> i didn't know that you spoke spanish 
Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yo hablo español también, pero mi inglés es mejor. <laughs> You're showing off. <laughs> yeah, my wife is Colombian, so I should know a little bit of Spanish because otherwise I would have problems with my father in law. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's a good way to uh, end, the, end, the, end the meetup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs>